Hello everyone, Thersites the Historian here. I'd like to bring back the reading series. It's been over a year, and I figure that the time has come. Let us indulge in the writings of the historians of yore. Today we're taking a look, our first look, at G.P. Baker's Tiberius Caesar, Emperor of Rome. I finished reading this book a few months ago, and I thoroughly enjoyed it, even if I disagree with a good deal of it. I don't know that much about Baker personally, but that he is someone who I really plan to look more into. Um, Baker was born deaf, and that kind of makes him interesting just in of itself. It's not all that common that you hear about military historians from a hundred years ago who were born deaf and yet decided to really look in detail at political and military history the way that Baker did. Um, Baker was British, he flourished in the 20s and 30s, and he wrote a number of books about some key Roman historical figures. So he has a book on Sulla, a book on Constantine, a book on Justinian, and you know the guy's a great writer and I imagine all of those books are well worth reading. It is worth noting, however, that he has a number of very odd biases in his work. He has some very unique ideas about what an ideal leader looks like, and I think it's safe to say that his views on that subject are rather heterodox. He despises men with charisma. If someone has charisma in that traditional sense of being able to gather men to him and being able to hold people's attention easily, then Baker makes the assumption that that person must lack intellectual depth and that they really don't understand the bigger picture. And that's a characterization that you see crop up over and over and over in his works. He has a marked preference for men who are inscrutable, men who are a bit awkward, people like Tiberius, actually. And in fact, his presentation of Tiberius is unusually positive. I have read some neutral presentations of Tiberius, but I've never read one which is just such a glowing endorsement. He really seems to adore Tiberius in a way that uh, I didn't think was possible. I don't know Baker's politics, but I do plan on finding out in the near future. If I had to guess, I would say he's probably a conservative, but I don't really know. This account was written in 1929, and in general, writing in the 20s was not a huge disadvantage for Roman historians, since most of Roman history is still based upon primary sources that were available back then as they are now. But one disadvantage that Baker's account of the Teutoburg Forest has when compared with an account written after the 1980s is that archaeologists have found the site and have been able to take a look at the ground itself. Until that point, we didn't really know exactly where the battle was fought. So, if you want a really detailed account of what probably happened, a tactical blow-by-blow, blow, you'll have to look at a more modern account. And um, even then, a lot of accounts of Teutoburg are a bit speculative, simply because there are two varying accounts. One is that the battle was over quickly, the other one has the three-day battle. Baker follows the three-day battle model, which I believe is in Tacitus. And so that is for the battle itself, but we're looking at Varus's defeat in a larger context, which is really what the passage that I'm reading is all about. One thing that you'll notice is that Baker has a heterodox, but in my mind, accurate understanding of Roman imperialism and the early imperial era. So most of Baker's contemporaries, and actually Roman historians today, typically believe that Augustus was only conquering things in a defensive way, that he was not really actively expanding the empire as a program of conquest. And this was part of a narrative put forward by Augustus himself, and then later also followed by the historian Cassius Dio, who lived a couple hundred years later. And so that narrative has been the dominant narrative about Augustus's foreign wars. However, uh, recent scholarship, including a 2019 book by Dexter Hoyos, suggests that actually Augustus was actively conquering things right up until the Teutoburg Forest. 
And actually that view, which is controversial right now, was already present in G.P. Baker's book all the way back in 1929. So you could say that Baker was ahead of the curve. He clearly had a different understanding of Roman imperialism than others around him. And I admire that. I think that's pretty cool. So, um, it's worth noting that in terms of personal biases, because Baker has some very odd ideas about what makes a leader, he has an unusually positive view of Tiberius that won't come up in this passage since Tiberius was not on the scene. And his view of Varus is far more negative than what is common. In general, almost everybody has a negative view of Varus, or at best a neutral view, but in this account you will see that Varus is the biggest clown in Roman history. Baker is completely dismissive of his abilities, he thinks that he was an utter fool, and that he had no right being a commander in Germany. However, some of this seems to be based on ignorance of the details of Varus's career. Varus was in fact both an insider with Augustus, who had been with him for many years, and also someone who was very experienced, or at least as experienced as anyone who was not a member of the imperial family. So when we look at Varus's career, about a decade before he would take over in Germany in the year 7 CE, he had actually been a governor in Syria with four legions, and there he had been equally harsh. So Varus was experienced, both militarily and as a governor. This was not something that was completely new to him. Furthermore, he was actually Agrippa's son-in-law. So this means that, of necessity, Augustus must have approved of him. And that's why he kept being used in sensitive commands. If Augustus didn't think that the man was reliable, he would not have given him four legions in Syria, and now three legions in Germany while he's trying to annex it, and while there is this large revolt in Illyria going on. So, um, Varus was not the complete and rank and competent that he is presented as by Baker. The view is simply too harsh, at least in my judgment. And I think part of the reason why Baker is so harsh on Varus is because he was apparently affable and somewhat charismatic. So he thinks, therefore, Baker, uh, Varus was a bit of a dunce. And again, I don't think that's a fair characterization. But anyway, I, I'm glad that Baker does really pour the acid on Varus because it's entertaining. So, without any further ado, let's jump in. We'll start with section 6 and go through to section 8. This will cover the lead-up to Varus's defeat and then the defeat itself. So I hope you enjoy, and let me know in the comments below if you enjoy G.P. Baker, and if you do, I'll be sure to read some more of his work. Chapter 5, The Revolt of the North, Section 6 The secondary effects of such catastrophes as the Illyrian War are often more serious than the primary. The repercussion of the events set going by Bato Dalmaticus went echoing through the northern frontiers of Rome, and did not die down until, many years later, Septimius Severus died at York. Perhaps they have not died out yet. While the revolt was at its height, and Tiberius was fully occupied in dealing with it, a decision fraught with the most momentous consequences was taken at Rome. Publius Quintilius Varus was appointed to the governorship of Germany and sent to the Rhine commissioned to begin the task of Romanizing the Germans. The instructions of Varus seemed to have authorized him to introduce into Germany such arrangements as would bring the new dependency up to the normal standard of a Roman province. It was, to say the least, a dangerous decision to make while the Illyrian revolt, itself due to a premature attempt to lift the province to the normal level of taxation, was still undecided. The drain on the resources of the imperial fisc certainly required that every possible expedient should be employed to raise taxation wheresoever it could safely be imposed. But no money so acquired could compensate for the danger involved. The appointment of Varus meant a departure from the principles which had hit hereto marked the dealings of Augustus with the Germans, and a reversal of the policy of Tiberius, who had been responsible for the settlement of the province after the death of Drusus. On its personal side, moreover, it was an extraordinary lapse of judgment. 
Varus was no soldier, and he was given the most important and difficult military command in the empire. He was an easygoing man, none too sound on the side of honesty, somewhat of a blockhead, and somewhat of a shark. And he was sent to manage men who, whatever their virtues might be, were then, as they are today, singularly astute, prompt and ruthless, and swift to resent the presence of a man whom they did not respect. They seem, after a slight pause, to have welcomed him with sinister pleasure and false smiles. The conversations which precede a conspiracy were at once set on foot. The opportunity was too good to miss. The head of this movement was Ermin, one of the younger chiefs of the Cherusci. Section 7 Ermin was of the same generation and apparently of the same age as Marbid, and like the young Swabian, he was deeply influenced by the new ideas which contact with Rome was spreading throughout Germany. But he was a very different type of man, and perhaps a more typical German. He did not share the cautious temperament of Marbod. He was more of a fighting man, and more of an intriguer, thinking and acting with a stronger sense of nationality, viewing matters from a less purely political and more distinctly Gentile standpoint. And more interested than Marbod, in preserving German independence and German tradition. The only common ground he shared with Marbod was a disposition to turn to new methods. His father-in-law, Segestes, was irreconcilably opposed to him, and firmly upheld the principle of friendship with Rome. But the motive of Segestes seems to have been the wish to keep the old tribal system intact, and to avoid the risk of its destruction by war. Ermin was prepared, like Marbod, to adopt a new system inspired by Roman models, and to sacrifice the old system in order to preserve the living reality of independence. If the conquest of Germany by Drusus did nothing else, it destroyed the prestige of the old tribal system, which had failed to withstand him in the field, and it impelled the younger men to learn the political conceptions which seemed to create so infinitely more powerful a social organism. Marbod represented one form of the new movement. He would have been willing to found a new state without regard for the Gentile link. Ehrman represented another form. He wished to found a political state while still recognizing and preserving the Gentile link. That is to say, he was feeling his way towards the principle of nationality. Both Ehrman and Marbod were men who had ventured boldly along new paths. The paths were to prove longer than they thought. Many a generation was to pass before the ideas which they mooted became established and were proved sound in practice. Far worse and weaker men succeeded where they failed. But their especial interest to us is that they stand at the distant fountainhead of a process which transformed the old local tribalism of Northern Europe into the nationalism of today. Section 8. The efforts of the conspirators to lull Varus into a false sense of security were admirably successful. They judged their man well and indulged his personal vanity and official pride to the full of its appetite. He proceeded to civilize the conquered barbarians with a firm hand. He assessed the province for taxation. His judicial decisions as governor ignored local usage and tribal law, to the fury and stupefaction of men who, knowing no other law, thought that they were being denied the benefit of law altogether, and the conspirators saw to it that neither party should be disillusioned. It took two years to bring the mass of the Germans to the breaking point. But by that time, Ermin and his friends had not only the Cheruski, but the Fighting Shati, the Marsi, and the Brute Terry, ready to leave the mark as soon as the word should be given. It was necessary to hasten, for the Illyrian revolt was dying slowly out, and before long the legions would once more be free. The governor's summer progress brought him, with three legions, to quarters on the Vaser, somewhere up near Minden. The principal conspirators were present in his camp, on the best of terms with him, and constantly dining at his table. Their conversation gave him a conviction of security against which the warnings of others were in vain. The summer was late when, in accordance with his regular program, he made ready for his return to the Rhine. There was no difficulty before him. His line of communication with the Liso, at the head of the Valley of the Lip, secured his line of march, and from Aliso the way was easy to Castra Vatera. 
the conspirators had their plan ready. At the last moment before he started, a message was brought that a tribe, well off the line of march, had risen. An experienced soldier might have scented danger. Not so Varus. He was persuaded that he could make a circuit to include this rising on his way home. He was definitely warned by Segestes, the Cheruscan chief. Varus dismissed the warning. He had confidence in his friends. Having now made sure that he should have no excuse whatever in the event of mishap, he set out on his march. The calculations of the conspirators worked out to perfection. All the preparations had been made. They accompanied Varus sufficiently far upon his way to make certain that he was walking into the trap. Then they excused themselves upon the ground that they had better collect their own levies in order to give him support. Even then, Varus does not seem to have suspected their good faith. Their levies were, as a matter of fact, close at hand. The word was passed. While the auxiliary troops garrisoning the tribal districts were massacred by a simultaneous concerted rising, the main body of Germans pressed after Varus. At some point between the Ems and the Lip, northeast of Aliso, the legions, engaged on their wild goose chase, were struggling through a rough and trackless country of hill and forest and marsh, where, encumbered with a heavy baggage train and many non-combatants, including women and children, they were obliged to cut their way forward, felling the great forest trees, laying down roads, bridging ravines as they went. The column of rout, disordered and strung out by its necessity, straggled still more when bad weather broke in violent gale and rain. The ground became a slippery quagmire. Falling branches added to the confusion. And now the Germans, expected as friends, fell upon them as foes. The attack came from all sides. Familiar with the ground, the Germans had no difficulty in striking where they would, at first with missile weapons, and then, encouraged by the feeble resistance, hand to hand. The column was hopelessly disordered by the first unexpected attack. It was never adequately pulled together. The legionaries, the non-combatants, and the wagons were inextricably mixed, and the legionaries were in no position to concentrate against the assailants. It was just such a march as General Braddock, a far abler soldier than Publius Quintilius Varus, found too much for him. The best place possible, considering the circumstances, was chosen for a camp that night, and an effort was made to get the column into proper order. In the morning, most of the wagons were either burned or abandoned, together with all baggage that was not absolutely indispensable. The second day's march was therefore begun in much more promising circumstances. The column forced its way temporarily out of the forest land into open country. It was necessary, however, to fight a way through another forest, and here the worst losses were incurred. The troops were pinned into narrow ground where any kind of concerted maneuvering was difficult. The column marched all night, for in the morning it was still advancing. A fresh downpour of rain and a high gale came with the dawn. Progress became impossible. Even foothold was difficult. Rain-drenched wagons could scarcely be handled. The bull's hide shields of the legionaries were soaked, with consequences that can easily be guessed. Few positions could be more pitiable than that of Italians lost in a North European forest in such weather. The Germans naturally suffered much less, and could choose their ground. Their numbers also had greatly increased. The news of success and the prospect of plunder were bringing up all who had at first hung back. The legionaries made an attempt to dig an entrenchment. It was destined never to be finished. The end was clearly enough at hand. Varus, wounded and hopeless, killed himself. His principal officers followed his example, rather than fall alive into the hands of the Germans. Vola Pneumonius, the prefect of the cavalry, abandoned the column with all his remaining men and left the infantry to their own resources. He was probably himself wounded, for he died during his march to the Rhine, but his troopers made good their escape. The exhausted survivors, thus abandoned, and without leaders, gave up the struggle. Many were butchered without resistance. 
Some fell on their own weapons. A few were captured. 20,000 men and three legionary eagles, those of the 17th, 18th, and 19th legions, were lost in the so-called Battle of Teutoburg. Only the cavalry and a small number of foot soldiers escaped and reached the Roman lines. The whole of the lands between the Rhine and the Elbe, which Drusus had with such difficulty and at such expense conquered, was lost by the Romans. The fate of the prisoners was terrible. Many were crucified or burned alive, or buried alive, excuse me, or offered up as blood offerings to the dark gods of the uh, German groves. Some were afterwards ransomed by their friends. Roman discipline was not mild towards men who had allowed themselves to become prisoners of war, but as an act of grace, the imperial government permitted the ransoms to be paid, with the proviso that the men concerned should not return to Italy.